Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Ward, a daily plant productions podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss Ward, wild bows return to the world of parahumans. My name is Matt Freeman, and this is Scott. Eat your goddamn spaghetti. Eat your own dinner, Matt. You weren't supposed to embarrass me tonight, Scott. This was supposed to be normal and nice. Why do you have to be so fucking embarrassing? I don't think that word means what you think it means. Eat the spaghetti. Fine. This week on the podcast, this this is the weekly podcast where you and I eagerly dive into Wild Bo's world of awkward conflicts of interest, spaghetti dinner horror, and alien-based death powers as we analyze and interpret this ongoing web serial. This week, the torch is almost out, Matt, as we discuss chapters 7.9 and 7.10. Victoria is forced to deal with a whole mess of emotions as she comes face to face with Marquis and the uncomfortable connections back to his daughter. Then, Matt, it is finally time for the Martin family dinner. And what a dinner it is. Yes. Um, this chap- this, especially this last chapter, the, the Martin family dinner, is amazing. Um, everyone has been blown away on the, the Reddits and so forth, and I'm really looking forward to discussing this pair of awesome chapters. Yeah. The, the I mean, the cool thing that happened was I read seven, nine on, I guess it was on Wednesday and I was like, wow, I feel like this is going to be the chapter that we are focused on. Like sometimes, sometimes we're evenly divided between the two chapters and sometimes more important stuff happens in one that we need to focus on. And I just think Victoria going through the stuff with, with Marquis was really important to her character and her story going forward. And I was all ready to, for that to be the one we talk about And then the next chapter came out and it became very clear that, no, it's actually going to be the exact opposite. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll have plenty to say about both of them. But uh, yeah, no. uh, Yeah. yeah. But but no, I I know what you mean. But that being said, we have a lot to talk about. So (laughs) why don't we just get right into it? All right. So first, the community spotlight where we read what people wrote from last week's thread and the discussion question last week was uh, basically describe what you think Worm and Ward's central name thesis is and how Team Breakthrough's name selections enforce the, uh, that thesis. Um, Megafire chose to talk about the differences between cape names and screen names, and they say screen names um, are our mundane way of defining ourselves. Our online identities often separate from our meat space ones in, in ways we get to decide for ourselves, our ways of presenting ourselves to the online world. They have the benefit of not needing to be pronounced or ever said aloud, which allows us to get away with things that might sound silly, uh, but look cool, like more dinner mail. Um, <laughs> compare uh, mangled wings to damsel of distress or swan song, for example, or, or heart-shaped pupil to look-see or look out. All the, all, all the names are self-chosen and all of them re- reveal facets of the person that chose them, but they say very different things and it's fascinating. Yeah, I like this a lot. I hadn't, when I was coming up with this question, I hadn't thought about screen names and how important screen names are to people, um, especially the author of this story. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I, th- I think that is a really interesting way to look at, at the different ways in which names can, names you choose can define you. I thought that was a really cool answer yeah i particularly like mangled wings because people were guessing actually way back um when it was only uh the glowworm chapters that mangled wings was damsel because they knew about the you know the hands and yeah the, but but what this is telling us now is like yeah i mean the hands the fixation on the hands uh throughout her entire interlude she has this fixation on her hands being able to touch things and so she's basically named herself after her hands explicitly yeah, yeah, that's great. I hadn't even thought of that. Uh, next up, we have FIP Industries, who says names define us if we let them define us and how we let names either self-imposed or imposed by someone else define us is reflective of how we let our flaws and virtues define us. Um, he, he goes on to say that we can be passive and just go with it like Taylor did, or we can be active, discard our old name, give ourselves new ones, and then tries, try to rise to meet the meaning of that name. They argue that because Breakthrough chose their names only under pressure because they were kind of forced to actually says a lot about them. Um, The big question going forward with them is now that they've chosen their names, how will they let them define them actively or passively? 
I think they they go on to say a good example of this would be lookout. Will she be on the lookout, vigilant, making sure that no danger, either physical or psychological, befalls her, or or will she unthinkingly take it from take from it the connotation that's connected to the one time she almost killed someone? And I think that's a really good point. That th- 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 this is the thing I really wanted to get to: this idea of choice and the idea of when you get to pick your name, when you get to pick your costume. All these things are how you take like choice. And I think someone else in the thread defined it as agency. It's, it's you taking agency over how you are seen by the world. And that's something that a lot of people don't get to do. I mean, most of us name wise, we have a name that was given to us. And I love that looking back on Taylor, two of the three names that she had throughout the run of that story were given to her by other people. Skitter was not a name she picked. Kepri was not a name she knew about. Weaver is really the only name that she chose. And that's when she's specifically trying to redefine herself. Yeah, yeah. I, I love this idea that, um, you know, we, we've been waiting for this whole story for them to pick their names. Um, most of them, including our protagonist. And they were basically forced to choose it, you know, under duress. And, and that's that basically says... Um, that it's an intentional choice, right? It's not like it's not like Wild Bo was like, oh shit, I have to think of their names today for some reason. It was like, no, yeah. the, the the point is to show that they were never going to come up with their names unless they were forced to, because I think when you're struggling with your identity, when you're struggling with yourself, um, it, it's that much harder to settle on an identity. And and maybe I mean, and maybe I'm wrong here, but I'm kind of, you know, I, I'm half joking when I say this, but like to be a kind of lighthearted person and choose a name like clock blocker um, is sh- shows a lot more like shows different things about a character than someone who refuses to name themselves for seven arcs. Yeah. I, I like that idea of they didn't, they didn't actually come up with their names until they were forced to, because there's this, this underlying theme of how do you define who you are and can, uh, can you define who you are until someone asks you to, right? It's like, do you just going through your everyday life, like think about who I am and who I want to um, show myself as to the world? Or does that not happen until someone looks you in the eye and asks you to tell them who, who are you? Who are you? Yeah. What are you? What is, what are you about? And in this case, yeah, it was these people that are struggling with that. And it isn't until someone kind of box them into a corner and says, tell me who you are till they actually make that decision. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested to see. I mean, Kenzie has essentially already changed her name once, which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we'll see any further developments in their names. Oh, yeah. Like maybe that they changed a different name. Yeah. Also. I don't know why. I don't know why we play like people don't know what happens in the chapters we're talking about. We do that every time. I I don't know why. Yes. I'm. Yes. Sorry. I was, I was thinking through a question and then realized I was wrong. Never mind. Um, uh, Shinichi defines the parahuman name thesis as a reflection of the need for personal choice after the traumatic experiences that gave them their powers. And he uses Team Breakthrough as a way to illustrate this. And he kind of goes through uh, each of the individuals and talks about um, how they're, they're responding in a more or less direct way to what happened to them, assuming we sort of know what happened to them um, in, in their in their choice of name. Like uh, Kenzie, we know it had something to do with embarrassment, so she's trying to avoid embarrassment ever again. She's on the lookout for it. Uh, Tristan is keeping Capricorn in an attempt to redeem himself uh, from how he turned turned into a villain. He's he's trying to you know stick with who he is, and he's not letting himself like turn his back on that. Um, Chris picked Cryptid because it was the most accurate name um, for for himself uh, and, and not not necessarily as a cape name. I think that's an interesting take. Um, Sveta, of course, is choosing to identify with something that that is, you know, very beautiful and gentle and um, something that a human has naturally, like a tress of, of hair, uh, even though, you know, she's has a, a monstrous physical body. So she's choosing to identify with, with, with that. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I like how, I like how they go through each of them and point out that they're claiming, they're claiming some control over 
their existence with their names in, in each instance. Yeah. My favorite was when they brought up uh, Victoria and the idea of Glory Girl as a name um, and how much that fit, fits what we understood of Victoria at that time in her life. You, part of me wonders how much of Glory Girl was Victoria's choice and how much of it was uh, suggestions and, and kind of pushing by her mother. Because I think Glory Girl, that name fits with the name Victoria that was given to her by her mom. And I think it would be very fitting that Victoria, Victoria did not pick the name glory girl or did in a, in a attempt to impress her mother or, or live up to her mother's expectations of her. Yeah. You can almost imagine that name being like workshopped around the family, you know, uh, Cape dinner table. Right. And they're like, I, I like glory, the idea of glory. Yeah. Yes. But, but we have to use a, something that indicates that you're young and yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Lastly, we had Arena Venera, who actually just like puts a word to kind of everything we've been talking about. Um, they mentioned that th- the reason why names in in the parahumans world are so cool is because they are diegetic aptronyms, which aptronym is just a name that has um, uh, it goes well with a person's occupation or or who a person is, and and diegetic meaning. It works. It is in the world like you have diegetic versus non diegetic sound, which is stuff that characters can hear or stuff that just the audience can hear. And so uh, a diegetic aptronym then is a name that makes sense and, and works to give us the readers of the story information about the character, but also gives people in the world like because they're picking these names, because they're choosing their names, it, it shows their decision making process and how they want to show themselves. And that's something that I th- don't think we've ever put the words to that, that what we've been describing, but that's, that's what it is. Yeah. Thank you for teaching me that word. <laughs> yeah. A- Arena Venera. Yeah. And I think that's all we had this week. There were a bunch of other great answers, but we have so much to cover. We just wanted to highlight some of them. Um, I, this is something I've been like turning over in my head for a while. So hearing you guys come up with it, uh, some, some thesis and, and analysis on this was really great. Good job guys. Good job. Yeah. All right. Let's move on into chapter 7.9. And we have newly christened team breakthrough meeting with Lord of Losses, uh, or is it Marquise's uh, hand-picked villain crew? Uh, Marquise makes a joke that I don't understand. Uh, he says, uh, ah, name pronunciations. I admire those that can reinvent themselves. Yeah. What's that all about? What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> is it a joke? It's... Anyway. Is it... It's it's mean. It's mean. I feel offended. Um, and Marky Mark is just acting really, really strange here. Yeah. Like, look, uh, we were going to actually do the thing where we pronounce his name wrong every single time. Uh-huh. And then I think I think you said like 10 minutes into the script, it got kind of old. So uh-huh. we're yeah, we're not going to do that. No, we're only going to do that a few times. Yeah. For the rest of the for the, anyway. re- for the entire rest of the book. Yeah. I so hope he's Victor- not in it too much. No. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. So Victoria is extremely freaked out by Marquis' presence, uh, but nobody notices this since people rarely notice when Victoria is internally freaked out. Instead, uh, they've noticed the apparent tension between Capricorn and the three men who have some business with him. Yeah, I like the way you worded that. Victoria is basically in a daze for almost this entire chapter, and very few people notice, with some uh, tentacle-shaped exceptions, of course. Yeah. Structurally, I really enjoy how this is done. Victoria is freaking out. But she is very concerned that people see just the warrior monk side of her. So she's trying really hard to hide it. And then we get this moment where someone asks a question where Karn says, is there a bit of history or something here? And we're in Victoria's head, remember? So we, like her, immediately assume they're talking about her. And I think I think this basically serves to reinforce the idea that that Victoria has retreated in her head and is barely paying attention to what's going on. She hears a question, doesn't hear anything, isn't observing what's going on, isn't observing who people are looking at or who people are gesturing to. It's just something she hears, assumes it's about her. And I think we, we do that multiple times throughout this chapter where someone is saying something and it like cuts into her mental processing as she's kind of like completely in her head and she just doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, you're right. This has happened with her before, but the, this entire chapter, she's very derailed. This is very rough for her. Um, yeah. I think it's it's funny that uh, the guy introduces himself as Carnassial or Carn, not Carney. Um, and then, of course, like the first time Victoria thinks of him in her like internal monologue 
It's, um, you know, is there a bit of history or something there? Karn asked. So she already uses the shortened form in her head. Like she's not even going to think of him as Carnassial. Yeah. I just thought, thought that was kind of funny, especially since we're already talking about names at the start of this chapter. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's like... The, we see her go into like almost full panic mode here, right? Like the, the text describes it as head turning, eyes widening. Like she is really good and and tries really hard to like hide her emotion sometimes. And that's kind of gone, like eyes widening. Like if someone was paying attention to Victoria here, they would surely notice something was up because that thing literally happens. Yeah, right. And then she's saying, how was I supposed to answer that? How do I frame in one answer something I couldn't frame in hours of wrestling with my interpretations of things alone? And I really like this response. She's completely unable to frame this answer. She has no idea what to say. If this person was really asking this question of Victoria, what would she have done? I, 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 she can't even complain to her. She, she can't even explain to herself what all this means. Like... I almost wish they were talking about her just to see what she would have come up with here. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Cause you're, you're, that's one interesting thing about books is they put you in the protagonist's shoes to the point where you find yourself, um, trying to think of the answer for them, which is ridiculous because it's not like you can tell Victoria, like Victoria, here, here's the answer. Yeah. I'll pass it to you. <laughs> um, but, but you kind of feel like, Oh, Victoria's struggling. My friend Victoria is struggling. I need, I need to think of the answer for her. Um, I don't know that that's how books work on me anyway. Like you, you start doing problem solving along with the character and that causes you to do exactly what you just said. You think, you think, um, well, how would she frame this? How would I frame this? What would I say on her behalf in this situation? And, uh, and it really puts you in an interesting place. And I like that even that, like sometimes as the observer of these kind of things, we maybe can can format that answer. There's a lot of times when you're analyzing a book, and I see this a lot in criticism when people are like, well, this is what I would have done in that scenario. But obviously you have a perspective that most people don't. But the thing I like about this is if I put myself in her shoes here, I still don't know what the answer to that question is. I still don't know how to explain briefly the history between the two of them and and why it matters. And, and it's it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But fortunately, bullet dodged. Um, we don't have to deal with this because it's just Capricorn and these three guys. Um, that's surely something that's never going to come back up again at all, ever. Yeah, it's a good thing we don't have to deal with that anymore. Yeah. No. Uh, so Marquis, never one to underutilize leverage, uh, does mention the family connection, even <laughs> though Victoria felt like it might have blown over. Uh, Victoria kind of pushes back, though, and insists that Amy is an adopted sister and that um, her and Marquis' time with Amy were completely separated in time. Um, but she feels petty saying it, though. Yeah, I, I really love this entire interaction. I love how as soon as Marquis says um, Panacea was my daughter, Capricorn just goes, shit. And, yeah. and that's, a, that's a really great little subtle thing because Victoria has not shared with the group her past. Um, she's kept this stuff very close and, and the group has just like gotten little bits of hints and clues. Um, there was the whole conversation about when she was talking to Byron last week where you don't like talking about your sister. And she's like, no. So they know just enough to know as soon as Marquis brings this up, shit's bad. And it's a perfect little, Oh shit. Yeah. Um, and I, and I love how petty Victoria is here. It is. She's so petty. Like, and she even, and she's so consciously petty. Like, she says, I was doing the exact same thing that had left me utterly enraged in the past when others had done it. And she doesn't care. She doesn't, she doesn't care. Yeah. But, but she finishes off by saying, I was proud, but not of winning the argument because it was a petty argument in a way. I was proud of getting through it. It was the kind of pride I couldn't really explain to anyone, even Sveta, maybe Dr. Darnall. So this, I mean, this is a big deal, Matt. Like, like we had this this really complex interaction with her therapist where she was basically challenging him and, and, and trying to piss him off, trying to make him uncomfortable, trying to uh, push him as much as possible so, she, so he would understand. And it's almost as if he passed the test that where, where she she made him she I don't want to say hurt him, but like affected him enough to where she finally thinks like, okay, maybe you understand just a fraction of what I'm going through. And it's like earned a spot in her mind. So he, she goes to him multiple times in this chapter. She says, 
a little bit later that maybe I'll go to him for help with this stuff too. Yeah, that, that's really awesome. And I like the focus here because um, th- the fact that she's proud of getting through it, um, it's it, it means that she's given herself credit for actually getting through it yeah. successfully, which you, as we've observed a few times, um, she very often runs away from situations or, or just tries to get out of them as quickly as she can. Um, which is kind of a form of running away. Like when she was, uh, the, the various times she's talked with her mom, she doesn't always literally run away, but very often she'll just sort of end the conversation prematurely. But here she's committed to making this work. She's committed to this team thing. She doesn't want to let the team down. And it's important enough for her that even though she may not be happy with how she does it, she does get through it and and come out the other side of it. And, and you know, she... Continues, continues to struggle with it, but it's 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 a success, and she can mark it down as a success. Well said. I think it's important to give yourself uh, a victory every so often. You know, it's it's yeah. a small victory, but it's still a victory. It still counts. Yeah, yeah. And and you're right that the the flying away is another recurring beat throughout this stuff. Every time things start to 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 wind up and get tense again, she has this real urge to just get the hell out of there. That's something Victoria does. That's something Victoria did like from the beginning like the the first chapter we talked about in the first battle um of the first arc we talked about how things got rough and her her instinct was get the hell out of here and we i remember we noted like how different that was from taylor and that's just kind of victoria's modus operandi when when things get tough she has an instinctual want to just get out of there yeah, yeah, and that reminded me. It's interesting because we've we have even talked about this exact uh, theme of of her wanting to to run away before, but I don't think I've ever consciously made the connection between that and the fact that this within the story itself has been exp- explicitly mentioned this idea of mover psychology that people who get mover powers um, tend to be the kind of people who run away from things or, or can't settle down in one spot. I, I think we, we learned a little bit about this with Prancer actually. Um, yeah. and, and, and yeah, so like, yeah, she, she, she identifies as a mover. She thinks of herself as, you know, as flight being this very useful power that she has. She doesn't take it for granted. I don't think. And it, she does have a little bit of that mover psychology, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, of course, Marquis isn't trying to start trouble in the expected way. Uh, on the contrary, he says that he owes Antares a debt uh, for being one of the few good parts of Amy's life, and he asks Lord of Loss to extend Team Breakthrough uh, courtesy. Yeah, we have a very uh, sharply done reminder to the audience of of kind of how Marquis works as a character, where he's a person that... Um, takes pledges and oaths and favors and these kind of things extremely serious like he is a person of rules and they are not necessarily the same rules that everyone else has but he he lives by them that's that's the thing he does and i I think i think that this this is this is like pushing victoria again like right this he, he finishes this whole thing saying i owe you a debt especially considering the nightmarish things way things that had have ended and that's ramping victoria up even more than before like this is the moment where she literally is about to fly away and the only thing that stops her is feta being there in that moment touching her arm that makes her pause just long enough to be like oh god if i leave now the team is gonna know like something and it's gonna mess up everything with them yeah. Um, and I think this yeah. is this, we're leading Victoria on a journey throughout this thing. There's there's a realization that he, she comes to at the end of this chapter that we're kind of slowly moving towards throughout this stuff. The, the realization that, hey, I got to tell these people about the wretch. And this is how we're kind of setting it up. Like she's realizing here that I just want to get out of here. But if I do, it'll it'll make my team have so many questions and, and wonder so many things. And they'll doubt me so much that I can't do it. And that's kind of how we're, we're pushing her to this moment of realization that happens at the end of the chapter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so Team Breakthrough questions Lord of Loss um, about what the, the nature of their rule on Earth N is. And there are cabins, apparently, on Earth on Earth N that the villains rent out as hideouts, basically. 
Um, and the, the villains are very intentionally hands off with the cabins. And they also discuss their belief that the recent infrastructure outages are actually the first phase of the long awaited war. Yeah. So I think there's a couple interesting things here. The first is we, we talked about last week how we should pay attention to how the world in this place is defined because this was, as we said, kind of like Skitter's warlord mode realized to a very large degree. And I think what we're seeing here is for anyone else, and I guess you could argue that Taylor had the ability to keep enough of an eye on everyone in her territory, even if it was 150,000 people, let's say that she would be able to keep, keep close on everything that was happening. But what we're seeing here is in order to run this place, Lord of Lost doesn't have time to worry about the things that aren't beneficial to them. So they let these people do bad things or or have a, a staging place for doing bad things, and they can't manage it. They just don't have the resources. They don't have the time. A little bit is that they don't really care. But I think that's the the flaw in that, like, the warlord structure is you've got so many things to do. You're, you're ruling through power and you you can't you can't keep track of everything and things slip through the cracks and when they do giant portals explode and bad things happen yeah right i mean kingdom come is like a a brute breaker and you know marquis is i guess a a changer but neither of them are are sensory or, or master types and you think about the most successful people who manage the territory what comes to mind to me is like Mama Mathers and, and Skitter, who both had exactly what you just said, this ability to keep tabs on everything. Um, yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is you could probably be pretty successful just with the ability to keep tabs on things, even if you didn't have the flip side of both of their powers, which is the offensive side. You could just have allies who you tell, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And that would probably be enough to give you a pretty good edge. Well, and we've seen, I mean, through the, the PRT in Worm, even when you are operating under the rule of law, keeping everything going requires a certain amount of looking the other way on certain things. I mean, that's what the PRT did. Like there was a general like if you're if you don't escalate too far criminals, we will pretty much leave you alone. And that's kind of what we're seeing here is like if these guys don't threaten anyone in their territory, aren't doing anything inherently dangerous, they're generally left alone. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So the, the other thing I wanted to talk about is we're, we're reminding ourselves on about the oncoming war again. And, and, and this war has been slowly building in the background for geez, almost the entire book now. I mean, like I think, was it, was it the second arc where the broken trigger happened? And that was kind of the start of the escalation that was, that was leading to this war. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly, but that sounds right. Yeah. yeah, But we're reminding ourselves again of this stuff happening in the background. And I think this is especially important given that the reveal at the end of this chapter kind of recontextualizes this oncoming conflict and what it means. But, but I like, I like there's, there's probably a temptation when you're writing this thing and I'm guessing to show some of the, the, the leading up to this war, um, some of the background stuff. Like if you were making this as a movie, cutting away to, um, meetings over and over again. We've only done that once. We've only had one interlude where we cut away to like some of the big powerhouses meeting and talking about this kind of stuff. Ward is so far still pretty street level. Our team, our point of view character is pretty street level. So we're staying on that street level for the most part while these big things are moving in the background. The team doesn't have the whole picture, so neither do we. And I think it's like there's probably a temptation to reveal some of that stuff and I appreciate how it kind of holds back on it. Yeah, and, and we're going to get pretty soon to what I think is um, rel- a relatively overlooked reveal. Um, I mean, I'll specifically mention that it's it's going to be when Kingdom Come says uh, Earth Earth Sea is a diversion. Yeah. Um, which is definitely news to us, and, and it just highlights what you were saying, that we, we don't know what's going on. We really don't, because we, we've been assuming that, that this was a thing involving Earth Sea, and we have some suspicion that teacher is involved somehow. Um, but that's like, we don't know anything. We really don't. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So they share their info uh, that Kingdom Come was with the portal terrorists. And they air their suspicions that he might have been fallen or at least a fallen sympathizer. But Nursery insists that he was decent. 
it Ward has basically primed me now, or maybe it's just me analyzing Ward has primed me. I don't know if that's a chicken or egg situation, but to 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 kind of call out and notice any specific mentions of religion, of spirituality in the story. And this was kind of served to remind me that someone with the name Kingdom Come is probably a pretty religious person. And when we were putting together our list of um, religious mentions in the story, we kind of forgot about this one. Um, the, the desire to link him back to the Fallen is, is really interesting to me. I mean, the evidence seems to point us that way. The Fallen were part of the bombing. He was part of the bombing. That makes sense. I think the really interesting wrinkle in this whole thing for me is hit like the difference in how people perceive religion and how people use religion for their certain names and spirituality and stuff. So we get a guy who they think might be, he's religious. So maybe he's part of the fallen. And then we get kind of a pushback against that nursery says, no, he was always kind. He was good. And, and then the idea of maybe like he believes certain things. He sees them kind of distorting and ruining the things that he believes in. And he has a very kind of Christian desire to um to save them to reform them to to correct their beliefs and and that's a very understandable christian mindset especially as a person who was raised in a catholic household um that's something i we we see and learn about a lot and obviously we see a little bit later that it's going to get him in some trouble but again we're 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 kind of on the outskirts exploring these different religious and spiritual themes and, and imagery and and morality yeah, that's very interesting that, that Kingdom Come may have sort of gotten into this out of a desire to try to um, be a positive force and then maybe got in over his head. I think that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. I, I don't know if I quite made that connection when I was reading it, but I like I like it. Um, so, yeah, for some reason, I feel compelled to focus on Kenzie a bit in, the, the, <laughs> um, in this chapter, even though she's not really highlighted too much. Uh, so sh- as they're showing the um, the villains, the pictures of uh, the people who they know were involved in the portal attack, she says composites, three dimensional models pulled from other places. Their best guesses. Um, so basically. I'm pulling this out specifically because of how glibly she lies here. Yeah. Um, and that, that I mean, that's the main reason that she's just able to. That the other teammates seem worried, like, "Oh, is she gonna is she gonna tell him the truth?" And it's like, "No, you're once again you have incorrectly modeled Kenzie's behavior and mentality because, of course, she's of course she's able to keep track of what she's supposed to not be not be telling the truth about and, and keeping hidden, and she she just uh, yeah she just lies." Yeah, and it's interesting because Kenzie has multiple times throughout the story talked about how she doesn't lie. I, I am honest. I will be honest with you. I will I will not lie to you. But we continually also see her lie. And so she's probably lying about not lying. Now, whether in the moments when she says these things, when she pushes back on people, is she lying in that way? And it's kind of like she does. I don't think she outright like says untrue things but she like kind of worms around it like i don't think this is an outright lie i think this is just a a, an omission of where some of this stuff comes from and i think lying by omission is kind of what kenzie does a lot yeah no i mean that's what's funny is what she says here is exactly true they're three-dimensional models pulled from other places uh i mean the places just happen to be the past but you know close enough yeah but I think the big thing about this statement, Matt, is is this is in response to Karn pointing out that the images that they're showing around are of capes in their civilian identity. And that's against the rules, man. That's one of yeah. the big rules is you don't go after capes and their civilian identity. And I didn't even like I think it just goes to show how much we are in the characters heads that that's something that didn't even occur to me when they were talking about this last week when they were going through the stuff it didn't occur to me that hey you're breaking one of those those big cape rules and yes this is ward now the rules have changed it says so right in the, the sub headline but i think it's it's very very fascinating that no one on team breakthrough seems concerned about that fact at all and, and look i'm kind of of the opinion that if you if you blow up a portal to huge sizes and mess the entire world's up. You've kind of forfeited your right to protection by these rules. But I do think it's interesting that none of them even kind of consider it. 
Yeah, they don't talk about it. I mean, yeah, th- yeah that's th- that's definitely true. I think it would be a, a bit interesting to discuss whether you know, or to have or to have some insight into what the characters are thinking regarding like, is this just such a beyond the pale situation that the rules are being set aside, or is it just like the typical thing where if you're like the slaughterhouse nine or whatever, then you you have forfeited your protection by the rules right. and, and your fair game. And, yeah, and that's the very argument they make here. But I just think it's fascinating that they make it post fact they make it when someone else pushes up against it they never had this internal discussion amongst themselves it was just generally understood yes these are bad guys we got to do it yeah and of course it was it wasn't even actually decided it was just kinsey was like here it is yeah that's true yeah so yeah so marquis presence is giving and terry's flashbacks to being around amy uh, and to, to the moment she saw amy again after gold morning and she kind of realizes that amy's new personality that she displayed there was basically picked up from Marquis. Oh yeah. I really love these moments all like throughout this part of the chapter. Marquis is talking and she'll just be connecting dots while he's doing it. Like she's not even necessarily listening. Like here, here he says the fact that a hero team is knocking on our door and asking about things suggests it might be important, which is a, a pretty important thing that he's just saying. And Victoria's response is not to process the things she just said, but to say, he looked so much like her, the eyes, the hair, the mouth, the shoulders, like she's just kind of like unfocused and just, again, in her own head. Yeah. And then, yeah, she, sorry, go ahead. She's, yeah, she's not analyzing what he said. She's not paying attention. Exactly. Yeah. And then that part that you brought up where um, he, he sees the way Marcus is talking, he sees Marcus's personality and he says, ah, I recognize this now. This is, I've seen this before and it's on the Amy that came to me at golden morning, gold morning. And I love, I love how she describes this on the battlefield after gold morning, Amy, my traitorous mutilated heart had soared at, on recognizing her. The, the, the word usage there, like, I, th- how much she's still grappling with the things that were going on in her head that were, were manipulated by Amy. It's like, it just, it just goes to remind you like how deep seated this uncomfort and, and hatred and messed up this whole relationship is. Sometimes you kind of forget it because I think we have seen Amy from a different side and we're maybe, I mean, definitely more sympathetic to Amy than Victoria is, but you see the way she describes this stuff. You see how, like how much it's messed her up. And it just kind of reminds you like, yeah, Amy did some really fucked up things. Yeah. I I mean, I think what's interesting, what's always interesting to me about the whole Amy situation, this is a bit of a digression, but like the most fucked up thing was going to the birdcage when like, and just leaving Victoria like that, you know, because right. you, you could at least make an argument that what she did was an accident. You can make the argument. I don't know if it's correct or not, but you can make the argument. But then going to the birdcage where she could never have any chance of ever repairing what she did. That was what that, that to me was what was actually messed up. Like the other things were sort of heat of the moment panic things where you can be like, yeah, that, that's that's fucked up. But the choice to just leave it that way was was what was unforgivable. Uh, anyway, that it's just something I, I don't think I've said before on the on the show, and I kind of wanted to get off my chest. Yeah, um, it's like if Marty McFly messed up 1985 and then just said, "Fuck, okay, yeah. I'm gonna go to the future. <laughs> Good luck with that 1985." Yeah, I don't know why that uh, popped into my head. Yeah, I think Back to dis- the Future is just like always in the back of my head somewhere. Yeah, me too. It is the best movie. But then he would just disappear, so he that's, would get his, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, um, so the, the part that I wanted to finish on this was she finishes up saying, I couldn't even remember what he'd said just now or the conversation before it, which yeah, is just, yeah, again, yeah. again, reinforcing the idea that as this stuff is going through her mind, extremely important conversations are happening. Like, remember when Victoria listed her big paragraph of things she needs to do, and she listed this talk with Lord of Loss as probably one of the most important things in the world right now that could decide the fate of the multiverse and she can't focus. She, she's not really even there and it's cause she's dealing with all the stuff and I'm not like attacking her for that. It's completely understandable. She's going through some shit, but um, it, it's just like, wow. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think that this may actually fall under like a different definition of 
um, or, or at least a different part of the umbrella of the definition of unreliable narrator because she's not narrating reliably, right? I mean, she's right. we, we just missed part of this conversation because she's unable to pay attention to it. And this is part of her nature as a, as a as a point of view character. This happened to her a bunch of times, even in the very first arc of the story where she'd be fighting and we would just like not actually see what was actually going on because she'd be on some inner digression. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's completely different from the ways in which Taylor was an unreliable narrator. Um, but I, I, I do suspect that you could still apply the definition here. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um. For some reason, I'm still focusing on Kenzie uh, here. <laughs> um, y- you set up and manage the security cameras? Lookout asked, among other things. I see. Hmm. Um, it's good you're trying. I've got your footage and my computer's back home and looking over it. It looks like she left yesterday at the usual time, but her bag looks bigger. She might have packed up. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's it's hilarious because like, she's just like, Hmm. Um. Like as and 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 then and then the condescending. It's good you're trying. Yeah. And then she's like, I I solved. I already solved the case for you. Um. Yeah. Also, by hacking I, into your video. Yeah, yeah. I took all your footage. By the way, that's something I did. We're here in these negotiations, and like Lord of Loss is a, a guy who's very serious about like um procedure and respect, and she's just like, yeah, I hacked you. I took uh, all your stuff, and I'm dealing with it. So good, yeah. good try, good try. Yeah. And, and no one really, yet, yet again, no one really calls her out on it. Yeah. There, there's a beat here that I find really interesting, though, Matt. And I, I wanted to go on a little digression here because they basically decide, okay, we have to go to this cabin. We have to confront them. And they're saying, okay, we'll do it as long as Lord of Loss grants us permission. And he does grant it. And he specifically references their interaction all the way back in arc one when they basically were in the middle of fighting each other. And then someone in the crowd shot Fume Hood and he said we weren't responsible for this. This wasn't what we want. And she believed him and he asked her to like spread the message. Like this wasn't our fault. This is what we wanted. And she did it. She, she kept up her side of the bargain. And this reminded me of the conversation Victoria had with Ashley way back on the train about this idea about how much perception matters, how much leaving people with positive impressions of who you are and what you stand for matters. If Victoria had been more angry with Lord of Loss and had indeed blamed him for what happened with Fume Hood, even even though um, he wasn't directly responsible, their team did attack and mess things up and, and created a situation where it was easy to get a shot off on this person. Um, if she had like taken that out on him and, and, and not tried to be positive in this interaction, he could have very easily said, no, I don't give you permission. And then they would have had a much more difficult time in dealing with this whole thing. Um, diplomacy, it turns out is important and you never know when you're going to need help from people. So maybe don't be a total asshole to them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, out of, out of like encounters between villain and hero groups through the entirety of worm and ward, this is one of the more like, just like cooperative. No one's right. like trying to, to backstab each other. No one's making snarky comments and trying to undermine the other side. Um, there, there's, there's a very uh, remarkable amount of goodwill here. And I think a big component of that is like you said, that, that uh, Lord, Lord of the Lost is someone who kind of uh, both Lord of the Lost and Mark West are people who consider it valuable to keep your word. And Victoria has demonstrated that she does that. Um, and that goes a long way with both of them, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so the team uh, plus the villains go in trucks to check out the cabin that the woman with black hair was staying in recently. Cryptid kind of runs out of the clock and transforms back into Chris, and uh, then they discuss their perception that Marquis is the one who's really in charge here. Yeah, did you did you get that vibe? Because I kind of got that vibe as well. Um, he, he basically, like, he doesn't, order people around but he exerts his influence on the conversation and and pipes up when he wants it to go in certain directions um in in very kind of subtle ways and i think the book confirms this by having sveta agree with victoria's assessment like i think if it was just victoria that had this read of hey i think marquis is the guy that's in charge behind the scenes I think we we would be able to argue that, well, you're not really paying attention. You're kind of knocked over by Marcus's presence here and 
you're not thinking rationally and you're not thinking this through. But by having Sveta kind of confirm it, I think it serves to kind of to kind of confirm that this opinion might actually be the correct one. Yeah, I, I think I agree with your assessment there. And also, just kind of what I feel about Marquis' personality from being in his head is, uh, you know, in Worm, is that, you know, he, he was a cell block leader in the birdcage, which right. means he has the kind of personality and the skill set um, to get into the position of power, keep the position of power, you know, use use all of his subtlety and, and manipulation skills um, to, you know, keep people like Lung in check. And it, it's it's actually harder to believe that he would be playing second fiddle to, you know, this young pup, uh, Lord of Loss. Yeah. And I think it is very much him to, yeah, to be to be the the background type guy. He doesn't need to be the the image of the leader. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah. He's fine running things kind of through his influence. Yeah. Yeah. And he does that calculatedly disheveled look. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm pulling this out because I somehow completely skimmed over it on my first read, and I wonder if maybe other people did too. Um, Sveta was sitting in the front seat. She turned her head around 180 degrees, tilting her body to one side so she could look past the headrest. I gave her my most convincing smile. Her arm released, the forearm in hand dropping between the two front seats. Tendrils bent, and her hand moved up to the seat beside me, reaching for my hand. I took it and gave it a bit of a waggle. <laughs> it's such like it's it's such wonderful, sweet support in the, the the perfect Sveta way. I mean, the detail with the the head and how she basically like loosens her hand and then moves her hand forward. So like it's it's so Sveta. Yeah. I I like it so much. Yeah, right. It, it's it's just funny to me that like I parsed it literally as like oh yeah, Sveta turns and looks behind her in the car. It's like yeah. no no, she's she's her her torso <laughs> holds still, her head turns around. And tips over, and she which, like, and she like throws her hand, kind of. Yeah, I mean, not throw, but she yeah. she un unhinges it from the rest of the suit and then extends it out, so which is just yeah. her hand and forearm. Yeah, right. And and imagining her having this this very like warm and concerned look on her face as yeah, you know, as you probably see like the tendrils in her like neck and under her hair, you know, twisting around so she can do this. And yeah, yeah. And anyway. I, I think you know this is important because. Sveta is the only one that knows a lot about what Victoria went through, and therefore she's the only one that can regularly know that something's going on with her. And part of that is just Sveta is a very um, empathetic type person. She she can read people when they're upset. It's kind of one of the things she does. She's a team mom, but don't tell her that. Um, and, and I think this is, to me, kind of showing that this is one of the reasons why the rest of the group needs to be caught up on this stuff. They need to know what happened to her and what's going on with her so they can know when she's in a rough spot. Like Sveta can't always be there to be the one comforting her. Like sometimes she's going to not be there and be with the rest of the team. And if they don't know what's going on or how to to help her or at least deal with her when she's in these these dire situations, um, it could be dangerous. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I actually tend to forget that, you know, Victoria uh, or is it Sveta really knows almost everything. I mean, she even knows just about. about she she knows more about the wretch than anyone else, certainly, although she doesn't know everything about it. Um, I think the only thing she does not know is the revelation that Victoria gave to Darnall, which is her feeling about her makeup as a, a human being. If she has other DNA, is she's is she part other things Is she a literal monster. I don't think she shared that specific with Sveta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so so Lookout takes some various kinds of camera shots of the cabin that they've driven to from a distance. Uh, while Victoria is spacing out, thinking about having to explain the wretch to her teammates, the team realizes that somebody is dying on the floor of the cabin. It's a kingdom come thrall, and he's apparently decided to try to make the thrall kill himself rather than starve to death. Uh, but he did this just before they arrived, so he's now bleeding out. Yeah, uh, I think this is really, really wonderfully done. And the first time I read through it, I didn't think so, because this is like it, it reads very confusing um, because you have Victoria in this really deep thought and then suddenly things are happening and 
things are happening so fast that it's it's hard to follow. But that's intentional to me. I think I think that's that's it's very specifically designed that way, because, again, Victoria is in her head, not paying attention to what's going on. And then suddenly action is happening. Someone is dying. We're like, wait, someone's dying. Who? Where? Where are we? What is? Huh? What? kingdom come like we almost like i don't i forgot kingdom comes power for a second there so when they're like there's someone here and it's kingdom he's saying he's kingdom come and victoria just like he's controlled and i was like wait kingdom comes dying like he's gonna die for good this is, what and i think it's so intentionally constructed that way to just confuse the heck out of you because she's not paying attention yeah i agree and i think that i had the same exact thought i think because I know I'm going to reread these chapters, I like am even worse with my skimming the first time I read through. Um, well, yeah, I also was like, oh, no, I like Kingdom Come. Yeah. Don't die. Oh, wait, this is just some guy, but right. they're still trying to save him because, you know, even Marquis, even Marquis is trying to save him. Yeah, but this is the, the her moment of realization, I think, where she finally decides I have to explain the wretch to the team, which, duh. Um, but I think this is really important for her. And she doesn't specifically mention Chris when she's going through this line of thinking, but Chris is someone that she's extremely worried about. And she's continuously frustrated that Chris won't share that Chris won't share what's going on with him so she can make sure that he's doing OK, that he won't end up in a place where he hurts himself or hurts others. But she's kind of doing the same thing with the team. She's not sharing. She's holding this stuff back. And I think she's finally throughout um, this interaction with Marquis throughout everything that's happened in this chapter, she realized that she can't afford to do that. I mean, she doesn't specifically mention the Chris interaction here, but maybe that helped too. Maybe she realized in that conversation that she was doing things similar to the way he was and how it was frustrating her. And it's probably the same for her team. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I don't, that she doesn't make that connection consciously, no. but maybe that's, yeah, maybe that's part of it though. Yeah. Um, I, I pulled this out just because it's standard uh, parahumans uh, horror. Right. Um, can't hear you, he said, sounding far away. I feel like I lose a little piece of me every time one of these bodies gets discarded. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, Marquis and Chris step in to work on stopping the bleeding. Kingdom Come uh, does say that Earth Sea is a distraction, which is what I mentioned earlier. Yeah, and this is that, that, that payoff. Um, yeah. This war has been looming on the horizon, and now we've just been told that this war doesn't matter. Or if it matters, it matters in that it's just one piece of a larger plan of, of gears turning somewhere else, doing something else, something presumably worse. If the war is just a distraction, that the, what it's a distraction for must be worse than this. Um, and... We don't know what this is. Again, it's it's we think it's something related to teacher. I've seen theories about um, we hear that he's he, whoever is pulling these strings is looking for um, congregations of, of capes where where capes are in big groups together. And that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it, it's all very it's all very suggestive, but it's it's still wonderfully um open-ended and vague sure. in a way that's fun to think about. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, it's, we've, we've, we've now, it's interesting how it is a reveal that there was a misdirection happening, but we still don't know what the actual truth is. So I think that's a, that's a fun kind of playing with expectations where you're like, Oh no, the thing you were expecting is wrong. Yeah. But that's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> right. And I think that's a fun way of doing reveals because I think you have to kind of lay them out like breadcrumbs. Like you can't, I, I don't think a story works when you keep everything a mystery and then reveal a bunch of stuff in like one foul swoop and <clears throat> lost. Um, yeah. By, by kind of revealing stuff as you go and giving little hints of information. I think we do this in the next chapter with Kenzie. We, we find out what's going on with Kenzie and her parents, but in a way that we, we don't know the, details of it we just know oh this is this is what's fucked up something's going on with this relationship and we don't know the details of it yet but we've given enough information to feel like we learned something new still and it's it's very 
it's very hard to balance that because you want to give information out bit by bit, um, but you want to keep some of the mystery because the mystery is some of the most interesting parts of it. Um, I think it's it's done well. Yeah, I agree. It's fun to think about and talk about the way that the long term mysteries are set up and sure, yeah, uh, and and withheld cleverly, which is a constant across all wild those stories. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. So Antares, as the chapter ends, scrounges up a piece of paper that suggests the parahuman prison is the area of focus for the baddies. Yeah, it is interesting that um, we were just talking about how no one's trying to double cross each other. Everyone's like working together and doing well. And then she like slyly steals a paper um, and doesn't tell the people she's sharing information with about it. She, she yeah. keeps stuff to himself. So the only one that's kind of like double crossing in this whole situation is our hero. A good point. Good point. But yeah, it, it's lucky that we got two friends in that prison, huh? That we can yeah. talk to. Yeah, which we'll do shortly. Yeah. Um, so 7.10. This chapter. <laughs> this this chapter. It's, let's just say at the top that we are once again transitioning into a horror story in this chapter. And it's, it's something we've done in, in worm a lot. It's something we've done in ward, but I think this is a very different kind of horror story. It's not the same kind of horror story. We've done more. This is a very kind of like slow burn, uncomfortable thriller kind of, of horror. And I think it works really, really well. And I can't wait to talk about exactly why. Yeah, I agree. Let's, let's go ahead. So we skip forward to Victoria meeting up with Kenzie a while later. Uh, first, she joins in on a phone call that Kenzie is making to Ashley and Rain. Um, I have to wonder, as an aside, are they supposed to have a phone or is this like a prison camera? Matt, it's, it's fine. It's, it's parahuman prison. The rules are f- flexible. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, so we get to check in on these characters. We haven't seen Rain for a while. Uh, They're both okay, but bored. They're kept isolated from other parahumans, and they wear explosive ankle bracelets, which I'm sure is not nerve-wracking at all. Nope. Um, Otherwise, they don't seem to put upon. Uh, Ashley has her roommate, and having her around is apparently both good and bad. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And this is this this excellent moment where Ashley says, you could call her family. Having her around helps some, but also hurts some. That's family, I said. Yep, said Kenzie. I suppose so, Rain added. That's yeah. family. I mean, family is like a, a big theme of, of this thing. Victoria's relationship with her family from her mother to her sister is pretty important to everything that's going on. And I think that's that's what we're kind of doing here. We're, we're kind of cleverly outlining and something that Kenzie will sp- state specifically a little bit later that every single person on this team has some pretty serious family issues, um, whether it's estrangement from their parents, um, complicated relationships with their siblings. And Kenzie is the one that we don't know yet. Like she even says herself a little later, I have the most normal relationship with my family, which is extremely ironic. But uh uh-huh. I think we're, we're, we're setting ourselves up for that in this moment. Like Kenzie yeah. says, yup here. She agrees with this. She says, yes, family is, is difficult. Um, and we're like, what does that mean? Kenzie, what do you mean by that? You're, you're the one that it's just kind of priming us for what's going to happen. Yeah. I was going to use that exact word that we're being primed to think about the family issues. And, and, and of course the chapter kind of gradually reminds us that we are heading to that dinner that Victoria's promised that she's yep. going to go to. Yeah, so uh, Kenzie overtly thinks about hacking into the prison security cameras while they're on the phone. Yeah, let's talk about this for a bit. I found this really interesting because here Kenzie wants to do an illegal thing, an illegal thing that might actually be very helpful to the team and what the team wants to do. But we leave this interaction with her basically agreeing not to do it. So how does this happen? What is the difference between this time where Kenzie wanted to do something illegal and the last time? Kenzie want to do something illegal. Well, it's Ashley, Matt. (laughs) It's Ashley. It's the only person who's paying attention. Right. And and, and let's look at how she does this, because I think this is really revealing. Um, She says to to Kenzie after she says, I when I hear security cameras, I get ideas in my head. And she says, be careful about fooling around. If you make a mistake, it reflects on us. Yeah. Kenzie said, I don't want that. I want you out of there already. Both of you. It will take time. 
you can call in the meantime. So she clearly defines the consequences. And it's not just the consequences for, for Kenzie. It's not just what will happen to her. It's you will you not just you will get in trouble. You will get us in trouble. You will hurt us. And I think that that's kind of dealing with Kenzie in a way that works with her. She is not really concerned about herself. She's not concerned with her own well-being generally. She's trying so hard to impress other people and she puts herself second. So framing the conversation as not you will get yourself in trouble, framing the conversation as, hey, this will hurt me and I know you care about me is a perfect way to do it. And then she ends the argument with saying, okay, I understand by by not doing this, you will not get to see me as often. You will not get to hang out with me as often. But look, you can call me. So she like ends her um, like trying to steer Ashley or Kenzie away with a thing that she knows will please Kenzie. And it works. It works beautifully. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a perfect description. Yeah, I mean, because if I, I do imagine like what what would have happened if she'd said this when Ashley wasn't present now that the team has demonstrated their inability to stand up to her uh, when she wants to do something mildly illegal that would be helpful. Um, they're all, they're all just different degrees of like, well, I don't know. And then Kenzie, Kenzie does her like smile and, and, and kitty behavior. It's like, Oh, come on. It's not a big deal. And, and they all, they end up going along with it because yeah. they don't understand. Um, right. Well, yeah. I mean like, Victoria's way of trying to steer Kenzie or pushing back against this was just stating, hey, this is uh, this is worrisome. This is troubling me. And Kenzie can dismiss that. Kenzie can deal with that. Yeah. But this line of thinking she can't. And, and even later in the conversation, Ashley says something to the effect of, I don't want my favorite person um, to get in trouble. And she's not like, I don't think she's saying this specifically to manipulate her. Like, I don't think that's, she doesn't think Kenzie is her favorite person. I actually think Ashley very much does think Kenzie is one of, if not her favorite person, but that line of dialogue, that line of conversation, um, is, is playing into the way she knows Kenzie likes things, but just subtly like steering her, right? Like, cause, cause in that moment, she's trying to say, you're doing too much. You need to slow down. Like you need to not do as much. And she does it by calling her her favorite person, which is a thing that Kenzie will eat up. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Um, yeah, so so they all decide that the, the angle they're going to take is to keep an eye on the prison staff, as that seems like a likely vector for the baddies to use in their attack. Um, the topic comes around to Victoria's eminent visit with Kenzie's family, and Kenzie expresses that she wants Victoria to have no preconceived biases about what she's getting into. <laughs> um, and I guess the first uh, major weird beat here is Ashley's statement, she's not your mom and that's not your dad. I love, like, we're going to talk about how the tension of this whole moment has been built, but every time a character hears about this dinner, they get, they get nervous. And yeah. and this is so this is so great, because first of all. The idea of, hey, before we go here, I don't want you to have any preconceived biases. I mean, have you ever gone to your friend's house for dinner and they're like, hey, before we go in there, I just want you to come at this with as clear of a head as possible, because these yeah. are some fucked up people like it's just it's just really ominous. And yeah. and then Ashley's statement comes in is really ominous. And then Rain's reaction to Ashley's statement is really interesting here, too, because his response is, oh, man. This is not the yeah. reaction of, of someone who didn't know this. The, the she's not your mom and that's not your dad is not a reveal to rain. That is a reaction of I've been down this road before. I've seen how this turns out and I know exactly how it's going to go from here. And he knows what's coming now. So we're, yeah. we're, we're also establishing again that whatever it is with Kenzie, this is something that the, the almost if not the entire group knows a lot about. Maybe not everything about. We'll talk about that when we get to it. But at least some of it. Yeah. I, I love, uh, oh man, as, as a, <laughs> as a verbal wince. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If they were in the room, it would just be like rain, rain winced, uh, but, uh, cringed or perhaps, um, yeah. So Kenzie then takes the phone off speaker, turns her back to Victoria and, uh, basically then concludes the conversation with Ashley, which keeps us from really, 
understanding any further what Ashley could have meant by that. Uh, we can only hear Kenzie accuse her of lying and then hang up on her in a rather upset way. Yeah. And and before they do, though, Ashley says, make sure Victoria calls me after she gets back from your dinner. And it's like because I can I can tell her about the prison. But really, it's probably like I'm going to need to explain some shit, <laughs> shit with yeah. you when you get back from that dinner. Um it's yeah. really great. But I think one of the important things here is we've just talked about how well Ashley steered Kenzie and moved Kenzie away from behavior that what might be considered questionable. And then in this moment, she basically says something that infuriates Kenzie, gets her pissed off and enough to hang up on her favorite person. So, again, the the, the juxtaposition between I am handling you and, and steering you in this very controlled, good way to saying this thing that immediately pisses her off. It's almost as if we're saying, look, this is serious enough where Ashley feels like she has to put her foot down. Like, this is not I need to steer you away from something. This is like I need to set a boundary. I need to set a boundary now. You need to understand something. I This is worrying. And again, it's all setting up the mood. It's all getting this feeling, this uncomfortable feeling that we're getting as we, we move into this stuff. And, and Victoria is just kind of like, what's, what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. What, what's interesting is that Ashley is, uh, while she has poor, poor impulse control, usually she's very able to moderate herself when it comes to Kenzie. So like you said, the fact that she said this, it was not a standard Ashley, um, losing her temper and snapping. No. It was, it, it was like you said, this was a calculated, she decided to say this. Right. Um, and, and bear, bear the brunt of what, of, of what came of it. Yeah. And, and you have to wonder, like knowing what we know about what happens at this dinner, what she was trying to either prevent or, uh, or hedge or whatever. Is she, is she worried about Kenzie herself or is she worried that Victoria will be so horrified by this stuff that she'll not take Kenzie's side and then Kenzie will be alone. And we don't know the answer to that quite yet, but I kind of think it's the latter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm that's, that's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. Um, so I like this, this bit here where Kenzie, I'm just going to read the interaction here. Um, we can do that. I can come over. I won't break my word like that. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything vital. And this is a reference back to her thinking that she'd missed things that were vital when it came to Amy. Yeah. And then, and then Kenzie responds, I'm safe. You're safe. My parents are safe. And they are my parents, just to make that clear. I have pictures of them holding me while I'm a baby. I don't have any runaway tinkerings. There won't be any captives in the basement. Nobody's going to die or get maimed. There's nothing vital. Can we just go? This is one of those um, Kenzie lies by, by omission, Matt. Nothing she said here was false. Everything in that paragraph was true. Yeah. It's, yeah. Just, it also, it's just leaving out some pretty important information. And, and, and like, re, re, like as soon as I read that, I was reminded of uh, uh, the thing in Get Out when um, toward the beginning of the movie, he says, I don't want to get I just don't want to get uh, chased off the front porch with a shotgun. Yeah. Um, which is a joke, but of course, that's literally what happens is literally what happens. Um, although it's a rifle, but anyway, um, get out the, is a pretty good comparison to how this dinner goes because, um, <laughs> w- removing the, the themes and the metaphors and the symbolism of that film, um, the, the tension and how it's held in that entire scene is very, very reminiscent of that movie. Interesting. Yeah. Perhaps I was primed to think of that movie for, for the same uh, for, for those reasons also, in addition to just the fact that, you know, what I meant by that specifically was like, you, you say all of the things to be reassuring that then turn out to be true later. Um, yeah, I, I mean, mean, we don't, we, we don't know what's actually, we don't know if, if any of this is true. It's just that that's what it made me feel at the time. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I um, I said in my live tweet, like, I immediately think all these things are going to happen now. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> right. So they take the train together to her neighborhood and Kenzie convinces her to keep an open mind and they talk about how Kenzie is going to school um, or how, how her school is going rather. Mm-hmm. Uh, they reach the neighborhood, which is very upscale. It is. And, and then we get uh, symbolism. Uh, the, <laughs> the veins of gold and yellow ran through much of it too. 
The middle and sides of the road were marked with serrated lines of yellow triangles. The area didn't have a dense assortment of street lights, and I imagine the triangles were meant to catch headlights in the dark so drivers would see three dotted yellow lines marking the boundaries of the road. So, so yellow and gold in this story symbolize corruption and flaw mm-hmm. and 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 uh, hi- hidden innate um um like like potential for disaster perhaps i'm, I'm kind of spitballing here but yellow doesn't mean anything good no. and we have ve- veins of yellow and gold running through the environment and, and girding it and s- making it so that in the dark that's all you can see yeah it's almost as if someone just like wrote Warning. <laughs> right. Yes. In in ward visual language. Yes. Warning. Turn around. <laughs> Get out of there. Yeah. We traced the call <laughs> coming from inside the house. Uh, uh, before we walk into the house, Matt, before we, we get here, we're here now. Before we step in, I want to talk about the setup. I want to talk about how we have set up this event and how that matters and how it plays out because we've done a lot of setup just in this chapter, right? We've talked about um, the the symbolism you just pointed out. We've talked about how the conversation goes when, when Ashley was talking her, they have this whole conversation where they exited the train and Kenzie's talking about how she both wants to grow up and she doesn't, she's like, both of these things have their issues and, and I I don't know which I want. And she kind of caps the conversation with her saying, I think I'd like to fix things and figure myself out and get most of the way of being better over the next few years. So it's like, yes, I want to grow up eventually, but I don't want to get there until I'm better. And I think what we're doing is, is we're messing with tone a lot here because we're kind of going through a tonal whiplash right now. We have this happy Kenzie who seemingly wants to get better. She just audibly said, I hope I'm going to get better. They're talking about school. They have a lot in common because they both really like school and they both really like learning. Um, Kenzie is kind of skipping along and doing this like heel to toe walk. Like she's like really, really playing up the childish side of her. Yeah. But underneath all of this, we have what Ashley said earlier in this chapter. We have what Chris said a few chapters ago when he said, good luck, have fun, come back from that and tell me again how I'm a priority on your watch list. We have what Ashley said back in pitch 6.6 where she, where um, she's trying to, to tell Victoria about Kenzie. She says, when I get in trouble for blasting beasts of burden, make sure she has someone, you or someone else. And Victoria said, her parents? And her response is, go to that dinner at her house or ask the others if you want answers to that question. We go back all the way to shadow... 5.7, the first time the dinner was mentioned. And Victoria turns to face all the other members of the group. Tristan, Sveta, Chris were all very different people and all faced me with expressions of alarm and horror. Um, so we, we go back to this moment. Chapter 5.7 came out March 20th. So it has been three months. It has been three months in real world time where we've been leading up to this moment. And every time it's mentioned, people have a very observable, negative, worried reaction to this whole thing. The book is screaming at you. You should be worried about this. But it's also telling you good things about Kenzie. Look, she wants to get better. She's making progress. Look at her. She's a kid. She's a little kid. And it's just... It's just messing with you and it's just confusing you. And that confusion, that difference between these two things is what builds tension going into this thing because you know you're expecting something bad, but you're seeing something good. And that yeah. that push and pull just ramps up the tension to crazy levels. And, and it does the same thing. It's working on you and it's working on Victoria because yeah. Victoria has been hearing all these alarms, these these red flags as she's been going through the story. But here's this sweet little kid who just seems to earnestly want to be able to recover just like Victoria does. Maybe she relates to her a little bit. Maybe she sees a little bit of her younger self. She's, she's very much one for second chances, you know, within reason, of course. Um, um, And so you're you're watching Victoria walk into this situation 
that she's been warned about and 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 the person who is leading her into it is saying i want you to go in there with no preconceived notions and it's like but maybe there was a point to all those preconceived <laughs> yeah, notions yeah i have i have so many preconceived notions yeah i have literally every single human being that knows you and your parents preconceiving <laughs> these notions yeah yeah um yeah so this is some great Great stuff here. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a foreground background thing happening here where there's a level on which everything is fine and normal as they enter the house, but the tiniest things seem off, usually in ways that are just, well, off. Like they're not overtly wrong. They're not clearly deceptive. They just invite questions. It's just like little details of how Irene reacts to Kenzie, which seems slightly outside normal mother-daughter tensions. Uh, the mom's creepy art. The fact that the house seems overly composed like a showcase uh, for which there's a surface level justification that her mom is a decorator, but could also be viewed as sinister in its artificiality. Um, And I mean, for fuck's sake, Scott, Victoria brings chocolate. That fucking chocolate, Matt. It's it's everywhere. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It's this is masterfully constructed. And I think it like. If you look at how mundane some of these interactions are that start off this whole thing. So like I said, we've been primed for this big thing. We, we've had three months worth of tension building and tension manipulation that are about to pay off. And we walk into this door. And what's the first interaction? We have the mom saying, Victoria, it's so nice to have a guest. We don't get an opportunity that often because we have a tinker in the house who doesn't cl- always clean up after herself. And Kenzie's response is, Mom, this is such like a normal family interaction, like the, the light parental chiding, the annoyed childish response. It's just so mundane and normal. So we're immediately like, like on our toes here because we were primed for this tension for this big moment. And it's just so normal. And, and that, that adds to the, to the wrong feeling. It adds to how everything just feels just a little bit off. And you're absolutely right. There is a surface level explanation for every single thing that feels wrong here, but it just creeps under your skin and you just, you're just waiting. You're just waiting. When's it going to happen? This is too normal. This is too, too casual. When is the, the freaking other shoe going to drop? When's it going to happen? Yeah. And it's just like, you just, you're just uncomfortable the entire time. You're just uncomfortable. And, and, and there's little beats here that are enforcing that uncomfort. Like Victoria says, because of the paint color, because of like how, how different the colors are and how clashing the colors are. She says, I feel like being in this house for too long might give me a headache. And, and we're just, again, reinforcing the level of discomfort here. She is like, like, physically uncomfortable which matches the the mental uncomfort that that you're feeling in this moment yeah it's it's all too too intense and too too artificial and uh like what's what's interesting is like if you actually visualize like what eggplant paint looks like like that it's it's it's, you're basically talking about an extremely dark house right so yeah yeah. just that's just like you just kind of realize what like visualize something that's like dark and and, and moody with splashes of, of color yeah. uh, here and there. Yeah, um, you got the unfinished paintings. Um, Irene like makes physical contact with Victoria, which in retrospect, like makes a lot of sense. Like there's almost like a an implicit like help me under yeah. underneath <laughs> all this. Um, and it's just like, yeah. you know, I, I, that's something that I did not pick up at the time, but reading back on it, when she like puts her hand on her shoulder as she's talking to her, like th- there's all this stuff going on. Yeah. I think I speak for many people when I say that I reread this chapter almost immediately after the first time yeah. I read it. Um, I think I've read not because yeah, I think I've read this chapter eight times in preparation yeah. for this. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Not just not just because it's not just because of this project, because I'm like, oh, man, I have to run down every little clue that's in here. Yeah. So they go to Kenzie's room and and Kenzie shows Victoria her awards memorabilia. Victoria sees the infamous seating chart, uh, but they don't really go into it. Yeah, but it's like, again, we're doing this this push and pull because like we go into Victoria to Kenzie's room and it's it's differently decorated, which is almost like off putting like it doesn't match. It's almost as if like 
no one else is allowed in this room but Kenzie. No one else can go in here. Her bed is made just by herself. Her parents clearly don't make this bed. Um, it's a completely different kind of room. But we have these like these moments of Kenzie like reminiscing, like she's showing memorabilia. And this seems like typical childhood stuff is like, look at my toys, look at my room, look at my collection. But like you said, the seating chart is there, this infamous seating chart. So every moment of oh, this is a, a normal thing is is ended and capped off with something a little bit uncomfortable. We see the seating chart. We don't really get into it. Um, and I, I like. This got me thinking, like Kenzie's obsession with the past, like she is obsessed with her former team, with the former people on it. She collects memorabilia obsessively, like even even more so than Victoria did. Um we've talked in this show about the theme of, you know, letting go of the past versus, uh, focusing on the past before. And, and Kenzie is very much in that mindset where she's, she's really into past interactions, the past, the good old days. Um, it's very, very interesting that, that this kind of lines up with a lot of the, the themes we've been, been exploring. And, and it makes sense for a person whose power is to literally record and retain things that already happened. That's what a camera does. I just find it interesting. And, and this yeah. whole thing kind of clued me in on that. Yeah, that that's true. And I, and I like that you point out that like, this is something they really do have in common because um, just, you know, the idea of, of the good old days is something they, they definitely do have in common. And it's one of the, the many things that are sort of softening up Victoria yeah. to, um, to Kenzie in a way that we maybe kind of have, have reason to be worried about. Yeah. But we have to talk about Kanzi. Yeah. Because yeah, we see here that there's, there, there's one picture that doesn't match any of the other pictures. I love how this is described alone on one empty space of wall was a picture frame with a very thick frame. The actual picture was so small. I could have put my hand flat against the glass and covered it. It was Irene, not as expertly put together, but very tired, with a swaddled Kenzie in her arms. The picture wasn't black and white, like so many family and individual pictures in the house, and thick letters spelled out the name Kanzi below the image. Kanzi? My name. I never liked having to explain it. I always had to spell it out. I like it, I said, but I like Kenzie too. So this is the one picture of her with her mom in the whole house. It doesn't match any other pictures in the house. It's different. It's like a picture of a picture. And it's in Kenzie's room. It's not displayed in the house. Um, I don't know. You have children, Matt. Um, yeah. Every person I've known who has children uh, displays a like there's there's so much weirdness with the pictures. I think it mentions that there's very few pictures of Kenzie. She's kind of spotted spotted in and out uh, there, but it's mostly pictures of her parents together. And that's like right. the opposite of what you see in a house with children. It's mostly pictures of the kids. And then right. there's one or two pictures of, of the parents, probably a wedding photo, um, maybe some engagement pictures, maybe their, their maternity pictures nowadays because everyone takes those things. But it's mostly pictures of the kids. And that's the exact opposite here. And then we have this one picture, seemingly the one picture of her with her parents. And it's different from all the other ones and just in her room. And yeah, again, we're, we're, we're setting things up here. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can't really elaborate much. I agree completely that that parents, you know, you'll you'll you may have the one the one wedding picture, and then and then everything else is focused on the kids. And and I think a better way of phrasing it maybe is is the family because you're you're underlining and you're emphasizing to both your guests and I think to your kids that like the family is what's important, and it's you know the parents and the kids right. we're all a family together right. and. Um, and it's, it would be, it would be really weird to, to go into somebody's house and they have kids and there's, there's only pictures of the couple. Like you would be like, yeah, aren't you supposed to move on to the phase where you are obsessed with your kids now? Cause that's the natural thing. Um, <laughs> it, anyway, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I agree completely. Yeah. So, so yeah, so Kenzie leads Victoria to her workshop, uh, and then talks quote jokingly about the idea of an innermost desires camera, uh, which one could just gloss over until you realize that Kenzie actually tried to make a mind reading device. Yeah. Like it, this is such a, a weird, uncomfortable interaction, just like everything else in this chapter, because 
she's joking, but yeah, she's talking about blackmailing people to pay her money by using a soul camera thing. But it, Matt, she'd never do it just because she couldn't get it to work. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, like I, she clearly tried this and had the idea, but it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's stuff like this where you'd think Victoria would maybe be like, wait a minute, hold on. You would use that if you had one. I mean, th- there's there's a degree to which Victoria's tendency to walk on eggshells around her teammates is very much impeding her ability to detect things that are happening in this chapter. That's true, because it, as much as we've talked about our general uncomfort with with things here victoria is worried but not like as much as we are i think and and maybe yeah. that's just a little bit of like we we think we know more than she does or or we're using our meta analysis to uh, dr- to be aware that she's in this horror movie and she's not but but yeah i i would think she would have more reactions to some of the stuff that she really doesn't. It, it really isn't until things break real bad that Victoria starts going, okay, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, um, I, I definitely, you know, especially after kind of thinking over the chapter, I'm like, yeah, I mean, this is just her, her kind of very delicate way of feeling her way through these situations and not yeah. wanting to step on any toes is leading her to let so many things slide as we get deeper and deeper into the situation and, um, and and just kind of fail to notice them. Um, Yeah. And I think a lot of it is probably Kenzie asked her to keep an open mind and she is legitimately trying. She, she is trying to go, she's trying to stay true to her word and go into this with as open of a mind as possible. And in doing so, she's, she's trying not to judge the things she sees. Yeah, and I think part of that is because she wants people to kind of take her with an open mind. Yeah, and she's, yeah. It, it, so she she can relate to that. Yeah, so um, during their discussion of her tinker equipment, uh, one item of which looks like a cracked egg containing a mannequin. Matt, um, you can't, you were just going to move on there. I, you uh-huh. were going to do it. And you can't do uh-huh. that, Matt. Uh-huh. It's a, Why, Scott? Because it's a... It's an egg with like a a robot person in it, uh-huh. and it's part of her teleportation project. What was she gonna was she was she gonna transfer people to a robot? What what <laughs> what was happening? The implications of this, Matt. Victoria. That's a good Victoria point. just looks over it and is like, huh? Egg. Huh. It's a egg. Huh. Was she yeah. birthing robot versions of people to teleport them? <laughs> Interesting. You know, um, probably. Who knows? <laughs> at, at this point, I would believe it. Of course you would. Yeah. So Kinsey uh, appears briefly distracted by something on her phone. Uh, of course, by the end, we realize that she's, you know, surreptitiously keeping an eye on her parents this entire time, watching them like a hawk and catching them in the act of something. Yeah. I, I, the thing that I like most about this is it is it when you go back and read it, it works as this moment of realization that's, oh, this is when she caught her parents, but it still works just as well when you don't. And I think it's because of how it's written, because there's this moment where like she twirls her phone and like, it's very visual. I can almost see like the, the, the twirling phone and then it's slow. Like it, we're in this really tense moment and the phone is like twirling and Kenzie, like it's casually st- like slowly stopping and then it stops in a place and Kenzie just cocks her head at a weird angle to look at it. It's this really kind of weird, uncomfortable thing. Um, and so I think that helps it work both when you understand what it is that she's looking at it and before when you don't. And also, it kind of reminds you, like, doesn't Kenzie look at her phone a lot? Yes, she does. Like, always? Always. And is she always just looking at, like, just checking in on her parents? Or or potentially other people, yeah, for that matter? I think the answer to that is absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. I believe so. Um, it's like, yeah, it, so, we, now, we now remember back 
to when Kenzie's father was driving Tristan, I think it was, in the van, uh-huh. and he didn't say anything. Why didn't he say anything? It's almost as if he knew Kenzie was going to be watching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so next they spend quite a while looking at some entries and and uh, it's, it's, it's talking about Kenzie's visual diary, which is a machine in which she records or or I guess constructs is more more the correct word uh, events to watch and replay to help her understand the world um I, I love this like metaphor I mean on the one hand it's somewhat worrying due to how intense it is uh, but how precisely is it different from like a very involved paper diary that a kid might keep yeah I think you're right um I, I had a very initially negative response to this thing Um, and then the more I thought about it, the more I I thought about it from, from your way of thinking that this diary, this visual diary is a way for Kenzie to observe and understand her world. And then she builds stories basically to try and figure out how the situation would have gone differently if we made different choices. I think people do this in our head constantly all the time. We reimagine things we've gone through and construct it. What if I had said this in this moment? What if I had done this? How would this have gone different? Um, artists tend to take those things they think about in their head and they write them down or they draw them or they create them in some way. Kenzie is just doing the tinker version of that. Um, the risk here is not that she's doing it. It's that if she gets like too into it, too obsessed with it, where it like takes over, where all she's doing is creating these false images of the way things happened and we've talked about how you can kind of rewrite your memory of things when you when you think about them in a a certain way from a certain perspective and she could potentially do that with these um yeah but victoria is on the ball enough to ask how long it takes to make these because that's kind of the, the salient question is like well What's what's the difference between this and a paper diary? Well, usually you don't spend like hours a day on a paper <laughs> yeah. diary. And, and if you did, that would be pathological. Um, and Kenzie kind of reassures her like, yeah, it takes me like 30 minutes per per episode or whatever. Um, and and Ken, and Victoria kind of accepts that as being a reasonable amount of time investment. And, you know, it's probably not the most healthy thing. But then again, you could make the argument that it serves as a, a way of her uh, letting her sort out her her feelings about things so maybe it is positive it, I, I just think it's a really cool metaphor setting yeah. aside whether it's good or bad i i completely agree and there's this wonderful moment in here where victoria connects with kenzie she she mentions that the, the white dabs on the visual diary label and how those mean like endings like death like giving up like like throwing in the towel and she manages to convince kenzie here that if she finds herself making one with a lot of the white on it maybe come talk to her about it reach out and Kenzie agrees with that. And it's this really warm moment. And God help me, it released some of the tension. It, like, yeah. we're, we're in this situation where we, we've been primed for this terrible thing and, and everything is unsettling and uncomfortable. And then we have this real moment of connection between these two things where v- Victoria is successful in reaching out to Kenzie and and getting her to agree to to talk to me to come to me to to let's work through this if things get bad for you i want to be there for you and that means matt that it's time for the fucking guillotine to to drop (laughs) and move in to the worst part because we we just once again the push and pull of the the warm good moments versus the underlying uncomfortable intention just ratchet everything up even more yeah, yeah, that's exactly exactly right that we we have this moment of oh, yeah, everything is going to be fine now because yeah. they they made their connection successfully. Now we're going to go have dinner and it's just going to be gonna, a nice yeah. dinner because everything's been so nice so far. It's just pasta. And, what could go wrong yeah. with pasta? Yeah, yeah. Uh K- Kenzie comes at the table. Oh, okay, dad. Um so yeah, Kenzie sets the table and the conversation's all very normal leading up to the dinner. Yeah, it is. It's very normal, extremely mundane. But like the beginning of the chapter, we're 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 full back in 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 tension building mode right now. So in between all this normal conversation, there are little beats that feel wrong. And one thing that really jumped out to me in rereads was this this little thing. Um, They're talking about how everything went in Earth N. And Kenzie says some unfriendliness, but it was mostly from locals. Definitely. I said anti-cape sentiment. It's bubbling beneath the surface. I've heard it, Julian said. I don't join in. 
It would backfire if I did, and it came out, I have one for a daughter. So this stood out to me as weird on a first read, but I couldn't exactly place why. But when you come back and really study what Julian is saying here, it really becomes apparent that they just fucking hate Kenzie. Like, like if you read how he phrases this thing, look at look at what he says here. He doesn't join in on the anti-cape sentiment, not because he doesn't want to, but because if he did and people found out that he was the father of a cape, that would backfire on him. And and, and the word usage, if I found out I had one for a daughter, this is very targeted specific wording if people i knew had if people i knew i had one for a daughter this is the same kind of language people use to otherize and dehumanize lgbtq people to to dehumanize people of other races this is it's very specific and it's saying something pretty big julian yeah. doesn't like capes julian doesn't like kenzie and and the thing that this did for me especially on rereads this crazy thing's about to happen. And my mind immediately went to what is Kenzie doing to these people? What, what, what terrible thing is she doing to these people so that they do this thing? But upon rereads and you see stuff like this and you start thinking, maybe these aren't good people either. And, and, and not to not to say that that Kenzie is right if she's like kidnapping them and holding them against their will. But stuff like you read stuff like this and you're like, maybe these are not these are not great people. These are v- possibly very awful people as well, because th- this wording like this is very, very specific. And yeah, yeah, I, I, I we were talking about this earlier, how I, I think on my first read, it caught my attention. And my interpretation was Julian is has inadvertently tipped his hand that he doesn't like capes. That, that was how I read it the first time through. And then subsequent times, I I read it as this is a this isn't this isn't inadvertent. This is a this is a fuck you, yeah. Kenzie. This yeah. is a dig, and and it and he's saying it in a way where Victoria, the guest, could conceivably not catch that that's what it is, but but Kenzie does, and I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure of that read of of the intention behind that statement. I th- but I think you're right. Um, yeah, because I mean, if you look back at all their interactions, if you look back at every time they ask, is is what Kenzie doing dangerous? Is she going to get hurt? The, the intent behind that, as we learn this thing, is not I'm worried you're going to get hurt. The intent is I hope you fucking die. And <laughs> it, it it changes everything. And, and I think you're yeah. right. They are they are protesting in the only way that they can. They are pushing the envelope in the only way that they can. And it is. It is, man, like, I, I can't wait to find out what's truly going on here because language like this, like, sends my brain in a whirl. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so um, Irene then brings out the food and then we all experience a mental record scratch. <laughs> um, because, like, I, I can't, I don't know how to convey it without, like, reading it, but I don't want to read the whole thing because it's like, well, that's, it's not really analysis, that's just reading it, but, but like... It goes from, it goes from, I took one chair. Irene sat across from me with Julian beside her. Kenzie didn't sit, instead picking up her plate. Kenzie, I asked. Do me a favor, don't make a big deal of it. Of? She took her dad's plate and said it where hers had been. Her own plate went in front of her dad. His expression changed. Solemn and grim both. And then, and that, that's basically it. I mean, from there it gets much worse very rapidly and you're just like what the hell is going on um i, I think it took me quite a while to figure out what was going on honestly um yeah. well it's because because it's, it's so confusing because like she's like dumping spaghetti on or pasta on plates and you're like what what yeah well let me to, to clarify i i figured i, I understood that she was mixing their food together and then yeah. and then giving her portion of what had been on her plate but but my brain just was so like not in that place because your brain is in the like oh we're about to have a, we're about to have a sit down we're about to have a conversation like you're expecting a maybe what's going to turn into a tense conversation over the dinner table yeah um and it and it takes such a hard left turn that you're just like oh shit well and and then i think the strangeness of it is reinforced by some of the detail because she spills sauce as she's doing this. She's doing it, first of all, very violently and spilling pasta and 
sausage and sauce everywhere as she's doing it. So it's like she's obviously doesn't give a shit. And then we see that one of the weirdest beats, which is the the hot sauce spills all over Irene's lap and she she doesn't touch or wipe the food like she she, she yeah. just sits there like still with the food in her lap all over her like red pasta sauce that like stains and is a pain to get out. She just sits there and that immediately, like you said, is like what like this is what it what is this? Yeah. And and it continues. I mean, there's so much good stuff like I, Irene started to stand getting in my way of getting to Kenzie in the process. Kenzie almost yipped out a no. There wasn't a better word for the tone. Yeah, like she can't even describe what the tone like like yeah. yipped is the only word that she can come to here. And 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 not only does this the child snapping at her parents in this way occur, but then Irene like obeys but but set like while seething says you shouldn't tell us what to do. And and, and so it's like she's she's obeying, but she's still like mouthing off i guess i mean it, it's it's so and, and then of course julian is like it's it's done it's not worth fighting um and and you, you just realize you just realize what the power dynamics here actually are yeah and it's purely it's purely shown it's purely shown and not told yeah and a lot of this is specifically setting out to reinforce the idea that this is not a rare occurrence like the, the way the way he's like it's not worth fighting like he's they've tried this before. He he knows what happens now that they're that they're busted and yeah. they continue to reinforce that throughout this, that 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 this is a, a common occurrence. Yeah, especially as, you know, she reached into her pocket for her phone, hitting a button before do- tossing it to me. Caught him. Always do. Yeah. Which, of course, implies, you know, always do all the other times yeah. that this happens. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. And then and then, of course, uh, Kenzie's like, yeah, you know, we should eat though. Your your food is fine, and Victoria's like, no, no, Kenz, we need to talk about this. She says, you said you were hungry, and the food, and, and she really is a good cook. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's just it's just like normal. She's just ready to sit down and have her food. Yep. Like like nothing happened there. Like nothing was big. And I love that Victoria says, like she says, I'm not hungry anymore, and she means it. Like she is so disturbed by what's going on that her stomach just says, no, nah, done, don't, yeah. done with this. Right. Finally, finally clued in. Yeah. Um, and then and then, you know, as the chapter is about to wrap up, Kenzie says this was supposed to be a nice dinner and it was just what you invited her here because you thought I'd be distracted. She laughed one note, smiled wide. I'm never going to be distracted. I'm always watching. OK, so stop. Be better. And and the smiled wide thing really caught my attention. Mm-hmm. And, and it reminds me. Like this is something we've never talked about, but this is so Kenzie smiling inappropriately, yeah. like when her and Ashley had had a throwdown back at their headquarters, um, and and she's like smiling, and then and then and then like weirdly getting super angry about strange things, like Chris touching her bad bag, which are not situations where you'd expect her to get angry. So it's just kind of a weird counterpoint, emphasizing or, or underlining her tendency to smile at inappropriate times. Yeah, and. You're absolutely right. And I, I almost want to go back and look at all the times where she she's had that big grin on her face because it's it's almost uncomfortable. And like in this context, it's so uncomfortable. And reading that stuff again would make it similar in that context, too. And I like like this almost doesn't sound like Kenzie anymore. Like the the, the yeah. way she laughs one note it's described as like it, she she almost transitions to a different kind of voice and it's it's so weird like like just was what you invited her here because you thought I'd be distracted <laughs> I'm never going to be distracted like it just feels so different from the Kenzie that we've seen um but not in an unrealistic way it's not like she's shifted character it's just that she's just revealed a portion of herself and it's yeah. disturbing or she, she's like dropping the little kid like right, yeah, gu- gu- guileless, uh, perhaps mask. I guess that that you you are beginning to sense has been in place the whole time. Yeah, um, and then of course the chapter ends. I'm sorry, my parents are such fucking embarrassments. She said before slamming the garage door. Um, and Scott, we've been setting up this word embarrassing, <laughs> this idea that Kenzie uses this word to mean, well, anything bad, no matter how dire. 
And I think that we've been setting it up for this whole story for exactly this moment. I think I think you're absolutely right. This is the this is the don't swear of of <laughs> Ward. Um, it's another little girl that's saying something that's just like, oh, oh, my God. And yeah. it's such yeah, it's such a powerful moment. And so this is where we leave the chapter. And we have to talk about the implications of this a little bit. Obviously, we don't know what this means. This could be a a gamut of things from they were trying to poison her to kill her or they were trying to force her to take meds or something to to control her behavior. Um, These could be I think some of the popular theories are that her parents gave her up when she was a kid and she found them again after gold morning and is like forcing them to stay here, threatening them. Um, I've seen some like my initial reaction was like to get more uh, projectiony with it and say like she just took some random people and then has them like like projections on them constantly making them look like her parents. I think that's less and less true the more I think about it now. I've seen some people say stuff like they, they it's her parents taken from an alternate earth. Um, these are all really interesting things and it's almost to me the least important part of this <laughs> because the thing I really want to know, the thing I really care about is how much the rest of the team knew about this because we we stated very specifically that they all know something. They all know when we talk about this dinner, when we talk about her parents and her relationship with her parents that something was weird here. Like the, Sveta stared in horror, um Tristan stared in horror. Ashley knows about it. Rain clearly knows about it when he says, oh, man, Chris clearly knows about it. How much do they know? And if this is really what what a lot of people think it is, if she has has kidnapped these people and are holding them against her, their will and her team knows about this, what does that say about them? Yeah, I think my impression was that like this works in a very interesting way narratively, because what they know about it is that her parents hate her and 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 are like and that there's obviously something yeah. really messed up going on between them but i don't think based on my reading that they know anything more than that yeah because and like you said if they did then you would be like well hold on like you're complicit in like a you're like a villain i mean it, yeah it's uh we yeah i i i, I just want to I just want to find out what happens I know. next. Well, you probably know, you bastard, but I just want to know. <laughs> um, well, that is yes. that is it. That's it. So, yeah, let's do a quick name game um for Kanzi or Kanzi perhaps um which um apparently is a Swahili name that translates to a treasure. Yeah, which is which is again interesting. It goes into we're thinking about uh her parents, did they give her up? Um, that's a very, that's a very specific name, I think. And, and I, yeah. and I think it's important we were talking about the importance of names this episode. Um, she had a name. She does not go by that name. And her, her reasoning is, oh, I got tired of spelling it for people, but there's some more going on there, Matt. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So discussion question for this week. What's your favorite example of subtle foreshadowing in Worm or Ward? It's a perfect week for this question because we've been foreshadowing this whole thing for a long time. And I will not be surprised if some people's answers are this set up for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, based on how I feel right now, I think that would be the answer. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's he's really good at it. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's all we got for you this week on We've Got Ward. You guys are all part of this show, so feel free to provide us with advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's reading. You can reach out to us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or over on Twitter at gotwormpod. My personal Twitter is at scottdaily85 and Matt's is at pasta. It's, it's and more if you're not, it's at uh, p- p- penne pasta. There you go. Um, if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Ward, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, pretty much anywhere else you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. This week on the Daily Planet podcast, Matt and I talked about Incredibles 2. We also talked about how we're going to be changing the format of that show a little bit in the future. So check that out over on the main feed. Also, Vow to View has us celebrating the 4th of July a little bit early. And Matt, Elise has never seen Independence Day. 
Oh my God. I know. I know. Don't know how to feel about this. Um, and uh, the next episode of uh, Weaver Dice Vegas uh, will be out later this week. Yes. Uh, p- possibly Thursday. I like um, it. So, yeah, if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, consider donating to our Patreon account, patreon.com slash Films. You can donate a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Supporting us on Patreon gives you tons of great bonuses like voting in our quarterly fan art contests, Q&A sessions, access to live streams for our recording sessions, and our excellent Discord chat. And I think the next uh, fan art contest will be coming up pretty soon, I think. I have to look at the dates when we do the last one. I think it's been a, a few months, so I think we're almost ready for a new one. All right, I'm excited. Um, so, uh, yes, also special thanks to New Planeteers at the $1 level, Brayden, Matthew, and Goldfish Bowl, and uh, Kryptonian uh, Lyric Lee. Updated, uh, upgraded to uh, the twenty dollar level. Um, yeah, and, and as always, make sure you go over to Wildbo's Patreon, patreoncom slash Wildbo, and donate to him as well. This is his world. We're just playing in it. And if you cannot afford to donate right now, that's absolutely okay. You can instead help us out by heading on over to Apple Podcasts and leaving us a rating and a review. There are no new reviews for me to read this week, which means you guys got some work to do. So send send us a review, people that have iPhones. Yeah, we'll read it. You'll be famous. Um, All right, that's it for the show this week. Uh, Next week, Arc 7 concludes. Yeah, right? I think. Yeah, probably. Okay, now I gotta go read that.